welcome everyone who is with us this evening. And this is our 10th webinar in the 15 webinar series, Learn to Deer Hunt. I'm Dr. Liz Rutledge, Director of Wildlife Resources at the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. So I just wanna thank you all for attending tonight's webinar. And this series offers a dynamic lineup of presentations and materials curated by the New Hill Hunter Education and Mentoring Program covering a wide variety of topics to guide new deer hunters from preseason scouting to processing. The series is hosted and moderated by the North Carolina Wildlife Federation in conjunction with its South Wake Conservationist chapter. So we'll do a little general housekeeping. Uh, we ask that you stay muted throughout the, the webinar until we have the question and answer session at the end. Also, this webinar is being recorded for future use, so please turn off your camera if you do not want to be seen on the video recording. We ask that you either put any questions you have in the chat box during the presentation, which will be read during the Q&A session, or you may raise your hand to be called on during the Q&A session. To raise your hand, use the hand sign in the top right corner of your screen. And so I'll take a couple minutes to give you some background on Wildlife Federation programming related to R3, which is retention, recruitment, and reactivation. So the North, North Carolina Wildlife Federation has partnered with NC State, the Wildlife Resources Commission, Wake County Wildlife Club, and other conservation groups to build upon current R3 programming and introduce college students from non-traditional backgrounds to hunting and shooting sports. And that is through the Academics of Field program that we're doing. We're also involved with Getting Started Outdoors, which is a partnership between the Wildlife Federation and the Wildlife Resources Commission to provide an all-day educational workshop and one-on-one -on -one deer hunting mentoring opportunities for participants. Um, for those interested in wildlife and conservation policy issues, the Wildlife Federation has the CAMO Coalition, which is a listserv to keep members up to date on policies specifically geared toward hunters and anglers. Um, Artemis is a National Wildlife Federation program that the North Carolina Wildlife Federation promotes to uplift women in sporting and conservation to provide small group hunting and mentoring opportunities for females. And the Proud to host this webinar series in conjunction with the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program and additional partners who are contributing the educational content for the webinars. In addition, uh, North Carolina Wildlife Federation volunteers Guy and Judy Gardner partner with the Wildlife Resources Commission to provide skills-based seminars consisting of Deer Hunting 101 and from Field to Freezer Processing. Uh, these are open to the public and they usually occur in September. Uh, the Wildlife Federation also works directly with North Carolina Hunters for the Hungry to facilitate the donation of hunter harvested deer to feed the hungry across the state. All right, so this seminar series was curated by the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program and its facilitating partners, which are listed here on the slide. The webinars are for adults new to deer hunting and includes practical topics to explore the ins and outs of hunting and enhance your overall outdoor experience. Please see the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program Facebook page for more information on field opportunities. And I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker, Killian Nowray. I'll provide a little bit of background on our speaker and then I'll let him introduce the webinar topic for this evening. Killian is an avid outdoorsman with a passion for wildlife conservation. It was during his years in West Virginia that he began hunting with his father, who has always been an avid outdoorsman and fell in love with hunting. While living in Florida in the sport fishing capital of the world, Killian fell in love with saltwater fishing as well. So when Killian moved to Eastern North Carolina in 2010, he finally found a place that had it all. Growing up in Beaufort County, Killian always spent his free time outdoors, either in the woods or on the Pamlico Sound. Over the last decade, Killian has spent significant time in the Piedmont region, and he has learned that hunting more pressured areas is a challenging but rewarding task, just as any other hunt. Killian believes North Carolina is one of the best states to be an outdoorsman with the geographic diversity that the state has to offer, and he hopes that everyone learns at least one new bit of information during his presentation this evening. So right now, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Killian. Thank you. Alrighty, uh, thank you, Dr. Liz. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, that is 
pretty accurate. Um, like she said, uh, I, I hope that everybody learns at least one thing tonight. Uh, some of you may have different experience than others with white-tailed deer and shot placement as we'll get into, but uh, hopefully at least you take one thing away from this. Uh, to the mentees that I've worked with in the past, last year, uh, I'm looking forward to getting back in person with you guys again and getting out in the field, getting to the range, all that good stuff. Uh, same with the mentors. Hopefully we can all get back together soon, sometime in the fall. Uh, and then to those mentors and mentees that I haven't met yet with uh, New Hill, uh, looking forward to meeting you guys. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a blast once we finally get back together this fall and next, next spring. Um, but yeah, so we'll be going over two, two topics today, mainly focused on getting to know the white-tailed deer, um, since that's what many of you guys want to learn to hunt and put your time into. So we'll focus on the white-tailed deer for a large portion of this presentation, and then near the end, we'll go into shot placement when it comes to hunting these deer. Uh, there's a lot of things to take into consideration when it comes to taking a shot. Oh, and then to finish it off, um, we'll have just a little bit of what to do after the shot and, you know, tracking, stuff like that. Um, and moving on from there, uh, let's get started. So the white-tailed deer. That is the uh, scientific name that I'm not even going to attempt to uh, to pronounce. Uh, whoops. Um, but the, the deer is a uh, herbivore, so it eats plants. Uh, it's similar to a goat in some ways. Um, they're both ruminants, which means that, you know, they have five chambered stomachs, which allows them to, to digest a bunch of different types of food. Um, generally, uh, as I understand it, they, they eat their food, um, so we'll swallow it and they'll go back to a bedding area, regurgitate it and chew it up again. Um, I guess similar similar to what a goat does, um, but as far as the things that they like to eat, uh, you know, they, they pursue leaves, buds, nuts, and fruit. And on the next slide, uh, you'll see some of the specific types of nuts and fruits and, and leaves that they do prefer to eat. Um, it's it's a beautiful deer. It's it's one of the best, or it's a beautiful animal. It's the deer is just iconic in in North Carolina and North America in general. Uh, sportsmen have been pursuing this animal for a long time, sometimes the wrong way, but uh, over the past 150 years, we've been really developing the, the right way to conserve the deer. Uh, I was just driving home from the grocery store and I saw a doe out in the field. And every time I see one, I, I get happy. I'm, I'm the guy driving down the road. And whenever I see a turkey or deer or goose, uh, I slow down, and take a look at them because I, I just, I've always liked the outdoors and I've always liked the wildlife. Um, but yeah, I, I love deer. I've been hunting them since since I was uh, seven or so. Uh, it's, it's a great animal. Um, but yeah, back into it. Uh, the, they have a potential lifespan of, of two to five years. Um, some some bucks, depending on you know the pressure and where they're at, uh, they can get up to six. I've, I've seen a six year old buck. Um, I read about a six year old buck before. Uh, but two to five years. That's that's general for for does and bucks. Um, especially when the pressure is low that's that's a good good estimate so th this is a little bit of a interesting topic you know in deer in north carolina the deer aren't as big as there's there's, there's states like michigan and iowa and pennsylvania so i've got some friends from those states that always you know give us a hard time for having a little bit smaller deer here in north carolina but I, I, it doesn't matter to me personally because I don't hunt for trophies. I, I hunt for the meat and the experience. Um, so yes, the deer are just slightly smaller here than they are in other states. But um, you know, 80 to 140 pounds for a doe, 100 to 200 plus pounds for a buck, that's a lot of meat for the freezer. And most of the people that I hunt with, you know, we hunt for the meat and we hunt for the, the fun of the sport, not necessarily for the trophies. Um, and, and also in my experience, I, you know, I've hunted all three portions of North Carolina, the coast, the Piedmont and mountains. And in my experience, you know, the Piedmont and the coast have decent sized deer, but as you go West, I've, I've kind of noticed going West, the deer do seem to get a little bit bigger. Um, and then when I lived in Florida, the, the deer were super tiny down there, but, um, deer size will vary depending on where you're at in the country. You know, if you're staying in North Carolina, expect the, the weights listed here. So here's a list of things that, that the deer like to eat. Um, some pictures of various plants that they, they like. 
Um, in bold is stuff that I'm always looking for primarily, um, not only because I'm most familiar with those, but because I've you know, consistently had success on those types of plants and, and uh, nuts. Um, but that's not to say that stuff in bold is irrelevant at all. Um, it's all good stuff. Uh, that's what you should be looking for when you're out scouting and you're gonna increase your chances of success if you're uh, near, near one of these uh, fruits or, or plants or nuts. Um, but corn, clover, green briar, those are, those are ones that I'm looking for a lot. Um, and then if I, if I happen to stumble across honeysuckle or mushrooms, I'm not, I'm not particularly looking for them, but if I stumble across them and there's acorns nearby, um, I feel like I'm in a pretty good spot for, for um, food source at least. That doesn't mean that, that you know, there's a good water source. That doesn't mean the winds, how I want it in that area. That doesn't mean the topography is in my favor. But food source wise, Acorns are my go-to. If I can find acorns and squirrels, anytime I find acorns and squirrels, I already know I'm in a decent spot um, for, for a food source. Um, moving on, let's get into the, the breeding of a, of a whitetail. Um, again, it's, it's a very similar process to goats in their breeding cycle, um, but this is the breeding cycle is actually called the rut. Um, I believe that's a universal term nationwide, um, but we call it the rut, and it varies in, in time across the state, uh, across the country. I, I personally don't have the answer as to why it varies in time. I don't know if it's about climate or elevation. I'm not quite sure. Um, that would be a question for a biologist, but it, it does vary based on where you're at in the state. And if you draw your attention to the bottom of the screen, it actually, this is a recent study from the Wildlife Resource Commission of uh, some of the average dates based on the, the data that they got from the does and the, whether or not they were pregnant or not at, at the time of the harvest, things of that nature, they kind of guesstimate the date of the, the peak of the rut. So as you can see, moving you know, east to west, it, is, it, it gets later in the year. So on the east side of North Carolina, you're looking at early to, to mid-October, late November for uh, the peak rut. And then as you get out west, there's some of those counties on there listed as, as being December 12th for the peak rut, December 7th, December 10th. Um, so as you move west, expect the rut to, uh, to get later, just slightly later, not too late, um, but expect it to get later. Um, and some of the seasons are, are kind of that like the deer seasons themselves are geared toward this as well. Um, just because during the rut, uh, the bucks tend to get a little crazy uh, for obvious reasons. And so they, they go outside of their home range, which we'll talk about next. So they, they're traveling more, they're covering more area. So they your, your chances of coming across a buck or a large buck, if you're going for, you know, a significant trophy are increased because that deer is traveling a greater area. So if you're hunting the same spot and you're not seeing a deer during the non rut period, well, when the rut comes around, you might just happen to cross into your area. So buck hunting, even doe hunting, because they're getting chased so much, it's really, really good to go during the peak rut season. That's that's when you're going to see a lot of deer, a lot of deer movement as well. Um, there, there, there's the possibility for secondary and tertiary ruts as well, um, because if a doe it doesn't get bred, uh, she'll continue to, to estrus, and so uh, that's that's a possibility for secondary tertiary ruts uh, moving up in through the later season. Uh, they are focused on breeding, so as I said, the, the bucks are really crazy during during the rut. Um, sometimes you'll just hear them come trotting through the woods, super loud. You'll think that you know, like a bear's coming or something. Uh, I've had deer or bucks just come bolting through the woods and kind of it's kind of crazy especially like if, if it's if you're new to hunting um you don't know what's what's going on uh, but during the rut they're all over the place it's it's a really fun time of year to hunt so as i was just talking about uh the home range of a deer is uh basically the area that they're they're living in for most of the time where they've got their food they've got their water shelter uh protection from various predators you know we are a predator, you know, we, we are going after the deer. So they, they need protection from us as well, especially during the deer season. So they like to get back up deep into some thick stuff uh, 
pretty often if they're getting pressured from a lot of different things, you know, coyotes, uh, bear, humans, whatever. Um, but as the season progresses and as the rut uh, comes around, the bucks specifically are going to expand that home range quite a bit. Um, you know, it's going to vary based on the breeding season because, you know, th that based on the time of year and when the rut occurs is when that deer is going to conduct his uh, giant, uh, when he's going to go outside of his home range quite a bit. Whereas during the, the regular season, during the summer, during the fall, if you look, take a look at the map on the right, during the summer, fall, pre-breed, one and two, um, you know, that deer is really in the same spot most of the year. Uh, he's not really going outside of that little oval shape um, very much. But notice the blue line, once the rut comes around, he expands his area significantly. So if you're posted up, uh, you know, down on those fields to the, towards the south side of this photo, where it's outside of the ovals, but, uh, but inside of the blue area, well, during the rut, you might just come across that buck. Uh, but during the, the summer or the early season, you, you might not see that buck. So that's another reason to, to really hunt a lot during the rut because the bucks are going to just be moving like crazy. Um, again, it's still hunting, so there's no guarantees that you're going to you're going to get one. But the, the amount of deer movement going on during the rut is quite a bit. And then if you take a look at the graph down in the bottom right, I know it's a little bit small, but it, it's it basically shows the, the same uh data just on a on a graph or a, a scale uh summer fall it just gradually increases to rut once it hits the rut they're getting that peak movement in the home range up towards 700 acres so you know summer and early fall they're around the the 250 to 400 acre range but once the rut rolls around they're covering about 700 acres in their home range which is which is quite a bit um i mean Heck, there's there's game lands in North Carolina. There's a game land, there's game lands in Dunn called the Rhodes Pond Game Lands. That's only 435 acres. So, for home range for a buck during the the rut, 700 acres. That's that's quite a bit of land. So going into uh, population density here. Um, this is a map of the white-tailed deer density in North Carolina uh, for 2020. So the, the, the map's a little bit deceiving. You, you kind of got to read the little note there at the bottom that talks about, uh, you know, the, how they got the estimate. Um, so it's showing that, uh, you know, Mecklenburg County and uh, the surrounding counties around uh, Winston-Salem, Charlotte, and even close to Durham and, and Raleigh, it's showing they have a lot of deer there. Um, it's important to note that that's because uh, the population density or the restrictions in those counties doesn't allow for hunting. So they completely negated, uh, they completely threw out what uh, that amount of land. So looking at Mecklenburg County, it's almost entirely gray, meaning that none of that gray area is, is huntable. So you just got to interpret this map um, in, in a smart way, because it doesn't mean that, oh, wow, the, the most deer in the state are stacked up in Forsyth County near Winston-Salem, a major metropolitan area. It just means in the hunting, in the, in the area available to hunt, there are quite a bit of deer there. Um, but in my experience, you know, I've hunted way out uh, on the Pamlico Sound, which is way out on the right, just in from the Outer Banks, Beaufort County. I've hunted out there, seen tons of deer. I've hunted in... Um, Wake County at the Jordan Game Lands, there's nice deer there, plenty of deer, um, and, I, and I've hunted out in the mountains and there's tons of deer out there, but one county on here did stick out um, when I was looking at this map, and that's Anson County. It's kind of a rural county, and it's all red, as you can see, and I can confirm that there are a ton of deer out there. Um, the PD National Wildlife Refuge, which is a federal uh, game land, basically, there's they do specific contra, um, uh, draw hunts. So there's only, I don't know, maybe five weekends out of the entire season that you can actually hunt out there and it's a drawing. Um, tons of deer there, tons of hogs as well, if you're interested in that. And then there's also the PD game lands, which is the, the state game lands in Anson County as well along the PD River. And that one, it's, I don't believe that's a draw hunt, but um, that one's loaded with deer as well. So I can confirm that, that Anson County does have a lot of deer. That one's accurate, um, but just, 
interpret this map you know take it with a grain of salt it doesn't mean that if you go hunt in one of the counties that's orange or red that you're going to see way more deer than you know one of the counties that's that's green um that's that's just not the case there's a lot of public land out in hyde and beaufort county so it's very rural so the deer have a lot of a lot of uh, space to, to roam whereas in the more metropolitan areas there's there's really not that much area for them to roam but i've seen deer crossing kildare farm road and carry so they're everywhere because they're very adaptive creatures um but yeah there's about a million deer in north carolina so we've got we've got quite a bit we've we've done a good good job with our our conservation efforts um and it's it's doing well and moving into a little bit more of a, a important topic to to be aware of as a deer hunter uh it's chronic wasting disease if you're unfamiliar with this it's a fatal neurological disease found in uh, cervids that can have you know really devastating effects on uh, on deer herds uh, or caribou herds you know when it when it says cervids it means anything in the the deer kind of family so caribou uh, elk deer things of animals of that nature um, but it's infectious and it can contaminate new environments by way of uh, disposal of a carcass or, or the brain and spine matter. Um, and that's why it's important to follow the very strict regulations that are in place for importing uh, deer carcass. So when you import a deer from out of state, you really got to read up on the regulations on that because it's very highly regulated. And it's a it's a big deal if, if you get caught with, uh, with, with a carcass that's not in compliance. Because uh, there's been cases reported in Tennessee, there's been cases reported in Virginia, but fortunately the Carolinas, we've been doing real well in preventing it, um, and there's been no cases in North or South Carolina yet. Uh, as you'll see at the, on the right hand bottom side of the screen, uh, that's a deer with CWD. Uh, you can see it's just, it's skinny, it's unhealthy. I believe a, a common symptom is that its head will be like drooping down. Uh, it's not going to be very alert, it's not going to be skittish. Um, and then you got the healthy deer on the right alert head up looking around checking for predators things of that nature but if you uh if you do harvest a deer in another state or if you're just curious about it you can check out the website below ncwildlife.org ccr and uh you know i put this slide on here because i just got the uh my my tags for this season i just got them last week and uh at the very bottom of the tags it actually has attention deer hunters help stop the spread of cwd and then it goes into some of the, the regulations um, for importing a deer and same websites listed at the bottom of the, the tags. So um, I think that's important to note. Obviously, the commission thinks that's important to to keep an eye on because they're putting it right on the, the deer tags that they send you. So please, uh, if you do harvest a deer in another state, please follow those regulations when you when you bring it back in. So uh, amazing antlers. Uh, common misconception or people just you know may not know the difference people may call a deer um, people may say a deer has horns um well that's not the case a deer have antlers uh and the antlers are made up of minerals and proteins um they fall off every year uh they're, they're made up of or they, they get covered in velvet in the mostly in the springtime you know when they fall off they fall off somewhere around you know december to to aprilish and then they'll start regrowing and when they regrow they look like the top right hand picture uh, they've got this velvet on on their antlers um, sometimes they'll they'll rub on branches or whatever to scrape that velvet off and it turns a little turns real nasty sometimes it's, it's like it's like a reddish kind of bloody color um, when it starts falling off and they they shed that velvet off uh, and then as you can see in the bottom picture, the final result is that kind of ivory looking color with the, the cream colored antler, a little bit of brown thrown in there. That's the final result. No, no velvet on there. Uh, it's very smooth. If you've never felt a deer antler, it's a smooth texture, kind of feels like a bone, kind of doesn't. Um, it's, it's, I mean, they're incredible creatures. The bucks, they're the ones who get them. Um, they look great. You know, some people hunt deer for, for better or for worse, they, they hunt deer specifically to get a big old buck uh, for antlers and, and get a trophy out of it. Um, and then they donate the rest of the meat. That's fine. As long as the meat's not going to waste, you know, more power to them. That, that's that's completely whatever. That, that's up to them. Um, 
I personally, like I said, I, I hunt specifically for the meat, but that's not to say that I'm going to pass on a, on a huge buck. You know, that's, that's a once in a lifetime kind of deal. Um, and I hope that you guys can experience harvesting a, a big buck and, and see what that's like. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, but the, the number of points on a deer's antlers, that doesn't necessarily mean how old they are. Um, usually what's used there is uh, the jaw and the teeth to determine how old they are. Um, you know, whether that's between you know, one to, to six years old, like I said, the average age range for a deer. Um, I remember uh, about, I think it was 2017, I had taken my deer to a, a check station in Chatham County and there was a biologist there um, and he, he did the jaw and tooth, uh, uh, whatever they're doing. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not a biologist. He checked the jaws and, and the teeth on the deer and, and uh, estimated the age. I believe it was a, a three-year-old buck, um, which I thought was cool. I'm not quite sure how they do that. Maybe, you know, how much the teeth are, are ground down or something. Um, but, yeah, that's the best way to estimate just how old a, a deer actually is. Um, as far as the difference between antlers and horns, um, Perhaps this is something that you didn't know. The antlers are, are what the deer have and they fall off every year. Whereas horns, you know, like goats, buffalo, antelope, animals like that, the horn's actually a piece of the skull. So that it never falls off. It's it's always grown until it, you know, it's done growing, but it never falls off and regrows like an antler does. So that's that's the main difference between uh, horns and antlers. So white-tailed deer senses. Uh, the number one scent sense that a uh, deer uh, uses, or its most keen scent sense, is its scent uh, or sense of smell. Sorry, uh, it, their their smell sense of smell is incredible. Uh, as you can see on the little chart here, our sense of smell is five million olfactory receptors. Um, but a dog and a deer, everybody knows dogs uh, nose specifically like bloodhounds and stuff like that that they use for tracking. Uh, we, everybody knows a dog's nose is, is powerful, but a deer's nose is even pow more powerful than a dog's nose. Um, and I can confirm this, you know, that, that it's impressive just how well a deer can smell. I was hunting one time at uh, Jordan Gamelands and uh, there was a deer downwind for me, came in the complete opposite direction that he'd come in from. I did not expect him to come in from that way, but he did. Uh, I was able to to maneuver myself in a way that I, in just a couple more steps, he was going to be right in my window to, to shoot at him. And uh, he, he didn't notice me. His tail wasn't up. He was very comfortable. He was feeding on acorns. You know, I'm always hunting on acorns. Always. <laughs> and uh, just out of nowhere, lifts his head up and bolts. And I'm pretty confident uh, he got a whiff of me just because the wind was just, he came in from a weird direction and the wind was not in my favor at all. But that's just how, how crazy, uh, crazy good a deer smell is. They, they are really uh, great at, at smelling danger. They know when something just doesn't smell right. Um, and they can smell it from several hundred yards away. Um, so do everything that you can to mitigate uh, your scent before you're going out into the woods you know some some old time hunters may not you know believe in the, the technology that they have nowadays um, spraying boots with with scent eliminator storing your hunting gear in you know like plastic containers away from all your other clothes away from you know dogs or your animals or anything like that um, minimizing your scent is big how well th these new technologies work you know that that's not for me to say i don't i don't really know um but what i do know is that you got to do everything that you can to minimize your scent so you know do what you think is best to eliminate that make sure that the wind is in your favor that's that's really what's most important um it's not worth busting a, a good stand just because you want to go out and hunt if you've got a good stand but the wind is not not the way that it should be for that stand. You know, I, I can't emphasize it enough. Don't go hunt that area because you could really bust it for for several days or weeks. You just really spook the deer out of there. And it's just not worth it. You know, just either go to a different site or you know take the day off. Don't don't hunt it. Um, 
but it's just not worth busting an area because the, the wind wasn't in your favor. Um, if you are out in the field and you do have to go to the bathroom, you know, you're going to be spending a lot of time out there. So it's, it's inevitable. Um, there's research that shows that, you know, deer are not going to react to human urine um, because every animal urinates. Um, I would assume, you know, the, the research is accurate. Um, I'm not quite sure how they conducted that study, but uh, that's, that's what it's saying. Um, and so there's no reason you, you can't go to the bathroom out in the woods. Um, so they might even check it out. You could make a, a mock scrape and we'll get into scrapes in a little bit. You can make a little mock scrape on the ground and, you know, relieve yourself. And it's entirely possible that a deer could show up investigating it. Um, not really sure what it is. You know, he might, he might not know that that's, that's a predator. That's, that's a predator scent right there. Um, and you're up in a tree about to take him out. Um, that's, that's entirely possible. Um, if, if you don't want to, uh, go to the bathroom in the woods. Um, that's entirely fine. Um, I don't blame you. There are containers out there that you can use to relieve yourself. Uh, I know one is called a Shiwi. That's that's a model for women. Um, perfectly fine. Perfectly acceptable. Totally get it. Um, but don't uh, don't think that if you have to go to the bathroom, you can't go in the woods because a deer is going to be spooked off. Um, that's that's just not the case, according to the research. The uh, the next sense that the uh, the deer are really um, big on using is is their hearing. Uh, if you ever have a, if you ever get in the field and you're you're watching a deer, maybe there's a deer that you know is kind of small, young. You you don't feel like uh, harvesting. You know, watch what it, watch what that deer does. Watch what it's doing in the field and its natural environment where it's comfortable. Take notes of that. You know. Try to understand the animal that you're hunting and, and appreciate it at the same time, of course. Um, you'll see that those those ears that they have, those big old ears, they they twist and they turn and face all different directions. Uh, it's actually 180 degrees that they can turn. And it's uh, pretty pretty cool um, that they can do that with their ears. I, I, I mean, I can't think of a dog that can do that, which is, you know, dogs are, are great animals. They're, their sense of smell is great, but... I don't think that they can turn their ears like a deer can. So next time that you're out in the field, you know, you're watching a deer, look at them ears. They're, they're going to be t twisting and turning, trying to hear everything that's going on. Um, but in that same vein, you know, you got to make sure that you're quiet. Uh, it's not duck hunting. You can't be loud and rowdy and, you know, making noise all the time, um, eating snacks when there aren't ducks flying. You got to be quiet. You got to be quiet all the time because deer, not only can they smell you, but they can hear you and they can kind of see you. So you got to be on your P's and Q's when you're hunting. You got you got to make sure that you're quiet, you know, minimize the, the noise from your snack wrappers. You know, if you're going to take a water bottle out, I, I wouldn't recommend taking, you know, one of those Aquafina bottles or whatever. I would recommend taking like a, a hard reusable bottle, uh, like a Nalgene or whatever, um, so that you can minimize the sound. It's just twisting off the cap or whatever. Um, Definitely don't use Velcro. Uh, if you if you absolutely have to use Velcro, I can't imagine what situation that you would use Velcro. You, you would have to use Velcro. But if there's just some piece of equipment that you have that has Velcro on it and you have to use it every time, uh, a little secret that I've learned is that if you use a highlighter and you draw on the, uh, the I'm, I'm not quite sure what the term is. The, we call it the female end in my job. The female end, the, the, the uh, fuzzy portion there you go the fuzzy portion of the velcro if you draw on that with a highlighter that minimizes noise quite a bit but again i would i would minimize velcro use at all costs um as far as um if a deer is looking at you and it's got its ears up you know don't move they're just going to be trying to figure out what the sound was if you made a sound they're, they're if their tails is up as you'll learn a little bit later that means that you know they're kind of on edge um but you know don't move don't make noise if they stick their head up and they're looking right at you just stay quiet stay silent and go from there uh white tail deer senses um number three would be vision um people think you know deer are you know they can't see very well they're blind um 
that's not the case. I saw a great video on YouTube um, a while back on, from the University of Georgia, if I'm not mistaken, and their deer research lab. They did specifically, they specifically researched uh, deer vision and what all, you know, goes into that. And not only did they realize that deer, deer vision, um, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's, I think it's like 140 degrees, the area that they can see in, but it's a, it's a wide field of vision. Um, and also the blues that the deer see uh, are way, way more vibrant than the blues that we see. So that's, that's one thing that they took out of it. You know, everybody thinks, you know, they're, they're colorblind or whatever. Well, they're not colorblind. They just don't see well in color. Um, orange, they don't see well at all. But blues, it's it's a sh and other short wavelength colors, um, they see that very very vibrantly. And so they did it with they did the study with um, food and, and noises and, and and different colors associated with those noises. And they found that blue is one color that really just sets them off that they see just extremely well. Um, what that means is uh, dress comfortably when you go and hunting. Make sure you're dressed in layers if it's cold. Make sure that you can take those layers off and you're not overheating because you've gone in on a long hike. Um, but do not wear blue jeans. That's that's kind of the one takeaway that I would like you guys to to get from this. Is just don't wear blue jeans. You know, you might get off work late and you want to go hunting. Totally get it. But if you're in blue jeans, you know, I'd recommend you know changing out of those blue jeans before you go in the field. Um, but when you are walking through the field, move slowly. Um, maybe take pauses to, to stop, look and, and listen, hear if anything's going on. Cause a lot of times you might, you might jump a deer going into the woods and you want to minimize that if you can. So scan the area uh, and move slow and quietly as best as you can. Um, Cause they can hear and they can see and they can smell you. So the odds are, are definitely um, in the deer's favor when you're in their, their territory. So, one thing that bucks like to do um, is is rubs, and a, a rub is when a buck goes up to a tree. Uh, usually, they're saplings. Very, they're not huge trees, um, and I've always found luck with cedar and pine. But they'll really do it on most little saplings, and they'll rub their their head and their antlers on this uh, the sapling to mark the scent, um, and and it's a visual marker as well so you know not only can we see it and we know that a buck was in the area but other other de um, deer can see it as well and know that there was a buck in the area so it's it's a visual marker as well just as it's a scent marker um multiple rubs in a line uh, may indicate that it's a it's a travel route um, so be aware of that um and you know i was guilty of this when i was younger i'd always get hyped up thinking that i saw a deer rub when it turns out you know it was a, a dying tree it was a dying cedar or something that looked like a deer rub because the bark was falling off but in reality it was just a dying tree so um if we have some field days i'm sure we'll we'll come across some of those uh rubs and be able to identify what a what a good solid rub looks like scrapes you know kind of how i mentioned earlier um if you have to go to the bathroom in the woods you can consider making a mock scrape um what this scrape is is if you the best way to describe it is if you, you really just look down at the, the little picture below. A deer, a buck, will go to uh, a, an area that has generally an overhanging limb. Uh, sometimes you'll see those little leaves and stuff, excuse me, nibbled off. Uh, you'll see stuff torn, hanging just barely by a little little twig. Uh, they'll, they'll put their scent on there. Um, they'll scrape away the the leaves or whatnot that's on the ground and generally they'll, they'll urinate on that area as well leaving their scent um because it's really meant to show who's in the neighborhood um if if they're made um in a big area sometimes there's there's things called community scrapes so multiple bucks will go to uh the same area and kind of scrape on the same thing um that's that's an entire that's a possibility those are I think those are less common because I generally only see these regular scrapes, but community scrapes do exist. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, definitely when you're when you're out going to your spot or whatever, if you see a scrape, try and figure out if it's fresh or if it's you know older. 
certainly by by figuring that out, you, you might even smell something off of it. Um, you might uh, notice that it's dry or wet, indicating that it's a little fresher, things like that. Um, but yeah, just keep your eyes out for that. Again, if, if we have an in-person um, meeting later this year, you'll be you'll hopefully be able to figure out the difference between a turkey scratch. You know, the turkeys do stuff similar to chickens where they'll move the, the leaves out of the way and then they'll peck at the little bugs and insects going around. So hopefully you'll be able to, to figure out the difference between those. Um, but you'll learn another skill if, if you uh, want to go turkey hunting, you'll know what a, a turkey scratch looks like. So some of the noises that deer will use um, to, to call, to you know, indicate that they're, they're in estrus if they're doe, things of that nature, um, they've got all these different noises that they make. Um, one is like a cough blow, and that's used to sound the alarm. Uh, if a deer thinks that there's a predator nearby or he's not comfortable, um, he, wants to, he wants to kind of scare the predator into revealing himself. And I can confirm, you know, bucks will do, deer in general, they'll do this this blow and you really might not even see the deer. You'll hear it, you know, kind of startle you. You'll be like, oh, what the heck? It, it's happened to me plenty of times walking into the woods, you know, deer see you or hear you before you hear them. And a lot of times they'll do that that blow and um, that's that's that, you know, they've, they've recognized you, they've identified the threat. Uh, there's also a fawn bleat. This is an effective call during the early seasons to attract doe. Um, there's also grunts. That's uh, everyday communication. The the tool on the right hand on the right hand side, right in the middle. Um, if you can see my cursor, it is the the tube shaped uh, call that is generally used for for a grunt. There's a bunch of different calls that you can use for the grunt, um, but that's an example of what a grunt call would look like. Um, that's that's gonna really get the deer going as well um, but it's important to know the sequence when you're doing deer calls if you do purchase one of these items you got to know the sequence uh, so read up on those I, I don't want to go in depth on each one right now um, but each different call has a diff different sequence um, that you want to use prior to or when you do use that item because you don't want to do a do a grunt or do a, a, a bleat and it not sound natural, you know, if that sequence isn't off, a deer's gonna know. If, if if I'm talking and I hear somebody talking from New York, I can know that they're from New York. I, I can already tell, even though we're speaking the same language, they, they can tell as well, you know, you gotta make sure that you're mimicking everything properly. Um, and then there's the rutting sounds, they're effective primarily during the rut. Um, so rattling, you know, you've got a little bag of, of antler material, you can rut like, you can do the uh, rattling like that, you can, Use some old or uh, artificial antlers to, to do a little battling sound. Um, there's also the estrus bleat, which uh, that's similar to the, the can right there that says Primos. That's a estrus bleat call. And um, well, I, I, I've had quite a bit of luck with that one myself, um, not only with bucks, but also with doe. And again, I'm not hunting for, for trophies. So I love using that one because I've had a lot of luck with calling in does with the estrus bleat during the rut, um, interestingly enough. Um, and then there's also the tending grunt. Um, but again, feel free to, to, to shoot out a message to one of us, the mentors or somebody that you know, to ask about um, these different calls if you're interested in buying one. Um, and I know myself and plenty of the other mentors would gladly help um, teaching you the sequence and which ones might work better or whatnot around the North Carolina parts. Uh, body language is something that you really want to pay attention to um, when you're when you're hunting deer. Like I said, if you're observing a deer that you're plan not planning on harvesting, take notes of it. Make sure you're, you're figuring out what those deer are doing in their, their environment. Um, if they're in danger and they think something's wrong, they're going to be alert. So their body is going to be upright uh, their ears can be facing you as opposed to facing all those different directions they can turn them in um, and they might just bolt away um, the longer that a deer stands still generally it's going to relax it's more likely to relax so it's like more likely to calm down if you're quiet you're you're not moving the odds are pretty good that it's just going to go back to foraging or whatever it was doing before it 
it noticed you or whatever it noticed. Um, so just again, be quiet, be still, and either things will pass or they won't, or the deer will run off. Just, that's that's hunting. Um, as far as uh, the tail, um, make sure that you're keeping an eye on that as well because that's that's kind of an alert to other deer um, that there's danger around without making a noise without making some some audible noise like the uh, the, the blow noise or whatever um, so keep an eye on that as well if they suspect danger is afoot um, but they haven't quite identified it yet you'll notice that a deer is going to do this little foot stomping so they'll, they'll pick up their foot and they'll stomp it down like in the middle picture on the right hand side um, and it, you know sometimes it can be pretty loud depending on how how uh, uh, hard the ground is so uh, that's that's one where, where they think something's wrong keep an eye on that um and if they're not quite comfortable eating um that then they're going to be lowering their head down bobbing it back up kind of trying to, to fool you trying to you know think if if there was a predator around like a coyote or something like that a bear they might think that the the, the bear or the coyote is going to move in as the the deer is back down feeding and then they're going to try and catch them off guard when they lift their head back up that's what they're trying to do there so uh, again don't let them fool you as they put their head down to feed you know just make sure that their head's down to feed and it's not about to to fake you out and pop back up and there you are moving with your rifle trying to get it get set for a shot um or draw them back with your bow and then you know all clear just means you know casual side to side tail wag they're eating they're grazing they're comfortable um ears are flopping back and forth trying to hear different stuff uh, you, you'll notice the difference the more time you spend in the field the more time you spend observing these animals the uh the deer as you've seen can, they can move several hundred acres that's kind of their home range um, and then when the rut rolls around up to 700 acres or more um and if you're hunting, excuse me if you're hunting mountainous terrain uh one thing that that i've found and that you know is general consensus is that saddles are really really good spots to hunt um so if you're looking at a map you're going to kind of see a saddle uh like on the right in the green that those two x's on there indicate a saddle um but if you're looking like first person view what you're going to see like on the ground take a look at the bottom right hand portion of the screen a saddle is simply where you know there's two hills and there's a, a little dip in between it's not a valley it's significantly smaller than a valley it's just a, a dip between two hills and that's commonly uh known as a, a deer highway i've always had luck um, seeing deer traveling in that area um, so setting up on saddles if you're in you know hilly or mountainous terrain is a great thing to do um, but you want to know where their food sources and water sources are because you're going to be moving back and forth from that. You're going to want to know what the deer tracks look like and what fresh sign looks like. Um, you'll get more education and training on that as we move forward. Um, fresh droppings, scrapes, rubs, you, you know what the scrapes and rubs are now. And the topography, that's basically the lay of the land. So saddles, if you're in, in hilly or mountainous terrain, always a good start. Um, and then bedding areas. Bedding areas will be one of the topics we cover in a little bit. Um, you want to know where they're they're staying at as well, so you can kind of connect the dots. You know, bedding area, tracks, food, water, and then you can kind of connect the dots and see just kind of where those deer are at. And then once you know the wind, you're 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 going to be able to set up in a pretty good spot and hopefully increase your chances of harvesting one. Um, my personal preference is in a very thick area. Uh, deep into the woods if i'm hunting on public land because that's generally more pressured than private land for obvious reasons um and then just off of a deer trail i don't you don't want to set up right on a deer trail because they'll come you know trying through you don't want to be on it you want to be offset from it um as long as that trail has fresh tracks i'm happy with it um and a food source as you guys already know i'm looking for acorns first and foremost or some other type of food source um and a rub would be great as well. Um, that's kind of my ideal setup. If I, I normally hunt in um, flatland, but if I'm hunting up in Jordan Lake, there's plenty of saddles up there, or in the mountains, there's plenty of saddles up there, and I'll certainly set up near a saddle as well. So this is an example of a deer trail. Um, on the left-hand side, so 
let me preface this. All the pictures in this uh, presentation are not mine, um, but as I have started teaching Hunter's Ed and uh, volunteering with uh, New Hill, I've started to realize that I need to take pictures of my own for uh, my students as you know to, to teach them with. So moving forward, I will definitely be taking plenty of pictures to share with you guys, but I tried to find the best pictures I could um, that aren't mine. So on the left hand side, uh, that is a really good example of what I normally hunt in. I hunt kind of in a, a swampy area a lot um, with tall grass. And so some of the trails you'll see in that type of uh, topography will look like that. You know, you'll see a path going through the taller grass and that's very indicative of a, of a deer trail. You know, just take a little look at the, the tracks. Generally the water's gonna be, or the, the soil's gonna be a little bit moist or wet because it's a, a swampy area. So you should be able to see good tracks there as well. But now if you're hunting in the mountains or uh, Piedmont where there's a lot of trees and, and dead leaves to fall and a lot of hardwoods, you might see a deer trail like, like on the right. Um, just zigging and zagging through the woods. Um, you'll, you'll be able to notice the tracks. It might be a little bit more difficult. You might have to brush some of the, the, the leaves away and whatnot. Uh, but that's what a, a common deer trail would look like, um, you know, in, in a lot of places. Um, maybe maybe thicker areas. Um, there's deer definitely like to go into thicker areas as well. Um, but that's, that's a common deer trail as well. So keep that in mind when you are uh, out scouting and whatnot. Bedding areas. Um, generally, the does will kind of congregate to together, and and bucks typically pick their own little bedding area. I've even read that sometimes a buck will will bed down in a scrape. Uh, that was interesting news to me. Um, but the, the example below, that's a buck bedded down. You know, but there's there's these common factors that deer, you know, bucks or does, they they like to have. You know. They need to have a food and water source nearby. Sometimes the topography plays a big role and they want to have a south facing slope. Um, that's one that some people might not know right off the bat. Southwest facing uh, slopes are apparently more, more uh, preferred for a deer. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with like uh, the, the winds and these, these heat funnels that funnel the wind as well. Um, I think that's what I was reading about the southwest facing slopes. The reason they do that is, is mainly geared towards wind. Um, a buck is then generally going to uh, bed near one of the doe bedding areas as well. So keep that in mind. Um, there's always going to be ample cover. They need that protection from from predators. They, they kind of want to have a little bit of sunlight um, because, you know, that's it's normal, especially in the colder months. They're, they're going to need some heat. Um, shrubs, weeds, grasses, briars. That's why I prefer going pretty deep into the woods into the thick stuff because you know, sometimes they do bed down in some really thick stuff like like briars. They, I've seen deer run into some thick stuff where I was like, well, wow, I'm glad I did not shoot that deer because had that deer run in back through his trail, back into his bedding area, whatever he's running to, there's no way that I could have gotten that deer because it was just pure briars and, and just way too thick to, to get back into there um so always keep that in mind as well um the hinge cuts that's the hinge cuts those are um what's the at the top of the, the picture um th that's a tree that's been cut by a human um and tipped over um to kind of create like a 90 degree angle with the tree um deer like that so you if you have private land um or if you're you're leasing private land you know Definitely be in contact with the landowners to get permission to alter it, to, to put shooting lanes in, to to in uh, to make the habitat more preferable to, to deer so that they load up on your land and not the adjoining land, you know. Um, hinge cuts will or can uh, bring in more deer because they, they like the hinge cuts. It gives them that protection. That's kind of one thing that, that deer like is and it can uh increase the, the chances of getting a bedding area in your plot of land um but uh this is some these are some examples of what a bedding area might look like uh the top left and the bottom right those are both from north carolina both from uh the mountain area of north carolina on public game lands as well i found those on a online form uh, one obviously is, is on a significant slope the top left is clearly on a significant slope bedded up against a tree uh, and then in the bottom right, you know, you've got 
probably looks like a, a doe bedding area. It looks a little large, kind of difficult to see. Um, but as you get out in the field, you'll you'll really know what to look for. You'll see the, the areas that are pushed down. Um, you'll see a lot, probably a lot of sign around or nearby. Um, and then on the left and bottom left, you'll see, you know, what a common swamp deer might might do they'll use that tall grass to their advantage they'll they really blend in you know this one's on the on the edge of the water so it's a little bit difficult to to picture but imagine if that deer was in the middle of all of that tall grass around it you know it'd be almost impossible to see them they, the colors match really well they're, they're camouflaged really well um so if they're in the middle of that tall grass you know they're they're doing they're doing real well uh, and then there's a picture of the buck up against uh, a big old uh, tree in the top right, uh, kind of down in, I don't know, it might be a small, very small creek bed or something. Uh, just post it up right there. Uh, that's that's also a possibility. Um, this is a an example of a of a hunting plot in North Carolina. This might be something that you come across. This is a this was created by one of the wildlife artists here in North Carolina named Ryan Kirby. Uh, he's out in the Boone area. And, you know, this might be one of his plots of land or just a, a random one that he drew up. But this could be common. Um, this, this is entirely possible. You might find yourself in a situation like this. Uh, so you've got the deer trails, obviously. You've got the peak of the hill. Uh, definitely, I, I would not recommend setting up at the peak of a hill. Uh, you want to find the, the, the deer trails you want to find the things that lead up to the peak of the hill um, where the bedding area would be you just want to make sure that you're you're positioned in good spots and as you can see in this picture having multiple spots is, is smart to have even on public land you know it, whether the wind is a certain way or whether your spot's taken because you saw somebody else's truck parked near your spot for walking into the woods having multiple spots is, is a great thing to have um and post up just off of the off the deer trails like i said earlier you don't want to be right on the deer trails you're going to be just off of them so that they're using the deer trail and you're catching them as they're coming by um but different access areas things that you'll also notice in this picture you know you've got a cornfield there's there's a food source there's the wind you know set up at your your stand as you would want or, or as the wind is blowing you know you want to pick the best stand based on the wind obviously you're not going to be anywhere uh, above the bedding area you're, you're going to be downwind of all that because you don't want to send your wind or your scent into the, the bedding area uh, and then you got all your different access areas you got a water source right here uh, this is just a, a standard situation you might find yourself in maybe i don't know uh, in the piedmont you know jordan game lands i always think of them you know there's there's plenty of stuff over there that that would mimic something like this um, when you're in the field, you're going to want to train your brain to, to detect these movements. So you're going to want to always be learning as a hunter. You're going to want to try and figure out what, what can I take out of this hunt every day, uh, every time you go in the field. So in this picture, I, you know, I don't know if you guys can see a deer or not, but there is one in there. Um, it's, you know, kind of on the, the left hand side of the, of the uh, picture. Um, but as you can see, they are camouflaged very well for that's that's how they're made. They, that's how they have have uh, that's how they're so successful in their environment. They are camouflaged to their environment. They they succeed well because that's that's how they were made. Um, so you're going to have to really focus sometimes if you're hunting thick areas like this in the snow. You know, the deer have white on them. You're really going to have to focus to see what uh, or see if there's even a deer around you know there's plenty of times i've been hunting and a deer has, has walked by through thick stuff and i only just caught a glimpse of it but he was you know ahead of me i should have been able to see him for a good 10 15 seconds but i only saw him for two or three because they're quiet they're camouflaged and you know they're in route to go do something you know they got lives too <laughs> they're going to eat they're going to drink they're going to breed whatever it is so you really got to just pay attention and and stay focused um you know it, it can be mentally draining sometimes if you're trying to stay on edge for hours and hours on end trying to pay attention for for deer um you know that's not to say you can't pull up your phone and check a score of whatever game's on or something but you know you really gotta pay attention to and be able to detect that movement because it's it can be difficult especially if you're hunting thicker areas um so here's another example of what 
what it might look like if you're hunting a taller grass area this is this is kind of similar to the colors that i hunt you know in the fall in a swampy area that the grass looks very similar to that golden brown color uh, but as you can see kind of in the center of the screen there is a buck there um you can you can barely see his, his the back half of his body because he's he's camouflaged so well um so definitely be paying attention um not to mention they're going to be quiet they can they can move real real quietly so they might sneak up on you if you're you know streaming a game in a in, in your deer stand that there might be a deer when you look up after two or three minutes just be aware of that and here's another good exercise. Uh, there's there's five deer in this picture. Uh, some of the, the first two, the arrows are not there uh, to try and get you to identify where those deer might be. Um, so you can see number three, number four, number five, they're kind of obvious. But where are number one and two? Um, well, number one is almost on the far left portion of the screen. Hopefully you guys, I'll try and circle them real quick. Uh, that's number one and then number two i believe is right in here it's either right there or right here um I, but as you can tell it's difficult to see deer especially with the lighting especially with the, the the topography what's going on right here and and when i was going through this exercise you know i thought to myself man i i can't ever think of a time that I was driving down the road or I was driving home and I, you know, texted my dad or I saw him when I got home. Hey dad, I, I saw five deer across the road on the way home. Or I saw five deer right along the side of the road. Five deer here, five deer there. No, I just, dad, I saw four or five deer. I saw three or four deer. You know, it's always that estimate three or four because they move fast. They are camouflaged. I can, I, there's no way that you know, driving down the road right along the side of the road where they're just a couple feet into the woods, you're going to be able to get a good uh, number on how many deer there were because they are, as you can tell, very, very camouflaged and very good at uh, at blending in with uh, the nature. Now I'm trying to click through. There we go. There we go. Yep. So as you can see, there's one and there's two. Shot placement. Alrighty, so transitioning a little bit, you know, we've identified what the deer is, uh, what their habitat is, things that they um, generally do, what their what their what their uh, habits are, what they like to eat. Um, now let's move into actually in the field, what you're going to do when you're you've done everything right, you've you've scouted, you've found the sign, you found the trails, you found everything everything has gone right you're about to be successful whether for the first time or the 30th time shot placement is important you know you're gonna mess up the nerves are gonna get to you you might nick a branch with a bullet or an arrow and sh the shot's not gonna be perfect that's the nature of hunting um but it's our job as hunters to to not only safely shoot at a deer with a, a arrow or a rifle or a shotgun but also uh make sure that it's ethical you know we don't want that deer to suffer that's that's on us we we got to make sure that that deer is not going to suffer so we want to we want to harvest that deer in a safe way and put it out of its you know its, its pain uh, as quick as possible so we want to make sure that our shot is lethal um so if you're hunting with a rifle or a crossbow make sure that your scope is on low power when when you're about to or when you're out in the field you can always dial it up you know always keep that in mind but always keep it low so that when you're in your stand or if you're on the ground you can see a wide area you raise up your weapon you can find the deer and then zoom into it you don't want to be zoomed in scanning left and right trying to find that deer inside of a very magnified scope um, but if you haven't shot a deer yet or even if you have you know i still get excited when i'm shooting my deer it's, just stay calm you're going to be pumped up your heart's going to be racing just stay calm relax you know and focus on making a good shot um, a lot of times before i i shoot uh, i'm gonna do a, a little oral bleep right before i'm about to shoot it'll kind of perk the heads up the the deer's head up a little bit um that's been very common we'll try and figure out what the heck that was because it's not going to sound exactly like a deer but it'll be close enough 
uh, and then that should make them still if they're walking and then fire, you know, aim, squeeze the trigger and follow through, you know, uh, just focus on a good trigger squeeze. Do not, do not jerk it if you're using a crossbow or, or a, a rifle or a shotgun, you know, nice and smooth. That's why spending time at the range, whether with a crossbow, compound bow, whatever your, your, your weapon of choice is, it's, it's important. You don't want to go out into the field and not remember, you know, just how much pressure you got to put on a trigger. You know, one rifle might be a, a four pound trigger squeeze. Another one might be an eight pound trigger squeeze. That makes a, that makes a difference, especially if you're used to shooting one or the other. Um, so just pay attention to, to the things that you're doing and stay, stay uh, knowledgeable on your weapon, stay proficient on your weapon so that you can make a good shot. Um, you want to you want to know where that deer was standing when you take that shot and uh, keep the angles in mind, because if if you're in deer stand, you know, you're, you're generally shooting down. So you should be all right. It's going to it's going to go probably into the ground more than likely. Um, but if you're on the ground, like I, I hunt from the ground a lot, um, you really got to pay attention to what's beyond that target. You know, if there's a house. 300 yards away it doesn't it doesn't matter that's there's a really good possibility that that projectile from that uh, bullet that that might travel that far so you've got to keep that in mind um let's see uh also um you got to know what's behind the deer um apart from you know houses or other people you got to make sure there's not a, another deer on the other side because uh you, you you don't want to shoot your third buck if you've only got two buck tags you know if a bullet goes through and you shoot one buck and it happens to kill the other buck well you're gonna have to make a phone call to the game warden explain that one um you'll probably get a break but you know you've got to know what's beyond that deer it's it's important to know what's beyond that deer because that's that that bullet doesn't stop that that arrow doesn't stop when it goes through the first deer it's it's gonna keep traveling nine times out of ten um but when you're when you're trying to pick where you're going to shoot, you're going to want to shoot, you know, towards the the heart and the lung area. So you know, th these pictures down below, they're they're great. You know, this is this is what you want. You know, I'm sure you guys have all seen little deer targets in people's backyards. The lung, liver, heart area is is important. You know, that's where you're aiming all the time, and you want to avoid the gut shot at all costs. It's it's not you know the end of the world if you have a gut shot. Okay, it's not. It might ruin some meat with all the bacteria and whatnot in there. It's going to probably take a way longer time for the deer to die, but it's not the end of the world. Okay. Um, but at all costs, please try and avoid doing a gut shot. You know, it's just, it's what you want to avoid at all costs. So on the broadside shot, you know, that's when a deer is standing just left to right. And it's a, it's the common, you know, deer target that you see anybody, anybody practicing on, cause that's probably the preferred method. Uh, so aim there just behind the, uh, the shoulder blade, really, uh, the frontal shot, as you can see, uh, it, we're kind of going straight at it. Uh, only thing to be aware of here is, you know, the shoulder blades again, and maybe a little bit of the, 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 the breastbone kind of area, but you know, that's not, that's not a horrible shot to take either. Um, and then quartering away. Uh, I personally really like quartering away. Um, I'll, I'll take that shot if I don't have a broadside any day, um, because you can really poke out into that that chest cavity. You can come in from behind it and work your way all the way up through the the heart, and lungs, and that chest cavity, and uh, kind of avoid tarnishing a lot of meat as well. You know, you might mess up one little shoulder, um, but that's better than two shoulders. You know, um, so quartering away, I, I am definitely a fan of that as well. So I think I have some exercises in here. Um, yeah. So top left, you've got some different. Um, uh, deer in in different stances you know you've got a uh, broadside you've kind of got a, a walking quartering away you've got a significant little quartering away and then you've got kind of a, a little frontal or quartering towards um so those are some examples of how you might see it with your with your weapon if you've got a, a, a rifle or a crossbow uh, that's what your sight picture might look like on, on the top right you know you've got what what you want to aim at and some other stuff to avoid so you've got the too far back 
you've got the too far forward and you've got that aim and that aim is right there behind the the, the shoulder blade um just just behind it um that that green dot's a pretty good spot you know anywhere in that area you're going to be you're going to be in pretty good shape um on the bottom left you've got a quartering towards or frontal shot um that's that's where you want to see i know it's kind of dark but uh that's that's a good good spot to hit it at and then finally in the bottom right you've got a uh, quartering away uh on a on a nice grayish colored buck uh, and that's where you want to shoot at in the blue dot again uh behind the shoulder but notice that you're at a little bit different angle um uh, than a broadside so you're aiming at a little bit different area than um than uh, the broadside or or in the, the frontal shot as well so keep those angles in mind um, when you're about to, to take a shot uh, this is a little shot placement exercise so you, again keep uh, angles in mind um, what's your position and your elevation you know are you in a deer stand well let you think about that for a second looking at this picture okay yes you are in a deer stand you are elevated based on this observation or or perhaps he's down below you on a hill or something but you are elevated above the deer based on this uh this picture this diagram um so keep in mind what's beyond the deer in this situation it's almost guaranteed to be ground so you're you're pretty good to go um think about where you might aim at on this deer you know are you going to go uh in the a's the b's the c's the d's and or you're gonna and you're gonna line it up with one two three four five six so think where you would shoot all right so you are quartering away you're elevated uh you're pretty much set for what's behind the deer you don't have to really worry about that too much you know where would you shoot to ensure that you're you're poking into that uh chest cavity well that's that's probably about where I would shoot. I'm, I'm elevated, so I'm going to shoot a little bit higher than I normally would for a regular um, uh, quartering away, because I'm going to I'm not only going into the chest cavity, but I'm also going down into the chest cavity. So I can shoot a little bit higher than I normally would to because based on my trajectory, I'm going to be going down and into the, the chest cavity. So somewhere around that E2, E3 range, would probably put you in pretty good shape um I, I saw this posted on one of the, the north carolina public land facebook pages and there you know go through the comments on that there's plenty of people that said d2 e2 d3 e3 and you know i think one guy even said f2 you know i think that's a little low i think he did wasn't taking into consideration that he's elevated um but somewhere in that little d and e two and three range would really put you in a good good spot to have a, a lethal shot once that shot's pulled off you know you're going to want to wait before you start chasing that deer uh, or tracking the deer i should say um because that deer is it's likely that deer, that deer is going to be you know hurt and dying obviously um but if you go too soon you could spook him up and he goes bolting off several hundred yards further and you're tracking just got significantly longer and harder um so wait at least 30 minutes in addition to that you know watch plenty of of, of uh, deer hunting videos on youtube or you know uh, netflix or whatever you'll see that you know when people are waiting other some deer might not even move due to a gunshot uh, some deer might come in after a gunshot wait you know you might have another deer come in and that's that's happened plenty of times on on plenty of shows my my buddy had a, a double kill last year that's that's just the the way it goes you know um pay attention to that wait and uh you know don't track them too early because you don't want to you don't want to stir them up while they're they're down and, and struggling um you're going to want to look for a hair bone or any kind of, kind of tissue on the ground if you've got a good shot you know you you'll generally see some of the the white hair on the ground where you hit them you'll you'll know you hit them uh, sometimes you might question whether or not you hit them or not because they may or may not do this little jump thing um but if you see hair on the ground and you see blood well you, you know you hit them and you, you can 
hope that it was uh, where you're aiming. Um, but if a heart and a lung shot, you know, the preferred shot, it's going to be a bright red color. It's going to be uh, frothy. Um, if, if you've got a piece of the lung, there, there might be some little white pieces of, of lung tissue in there. Um, sometimes it's a little bit like bubbly, like, you know, getting blown out of the lung. So it's, it's a bubbly kind of kind of blood. Um, a liver shot is going to be pretty dark and thick. Um, and then a stomach and the gut shot is going to be some probably some nasty stuff on the ground. Um, you might struggle to find a good little a good blood trail to uh, to track. So, you know, another reason to avoid the gut shot at all costs. Not not it's not the end of the world, but definitely want to avoid it um, because it, it just makes your life more difficult. Tracking a deer um, moving forward, you're going to you're going to see blood just like in the top right uh, picture. Uh, that's you know probably a, a lung heart shot uh, it's, a, it's a nice bright red color very easy to see on green leaves you know it's probably an early season hunt but you really got to keep in mind that as time progresses as the season progresses it's going to get harder to to pay attention or to not to pay attention but to, to find the blood on some of the dead leaves on the ground so in the bottom right you know that's that's fall leaves right there that's just regular brown leaves well imagine what what some of the leaves are like when it's you know they had just fallen off they're they're reddish orange it's it can be very difficult to to get on a a blood trail so when you do find that blood whether it's early season late season mark it you know use toilet paper to, to mark the blood that you found so that if you lose it you can walk back and try and find it again um but mark it as you go so that you can you can keep track of it um do everything that you can to retrieve the deer you you can you really owe it to the deer to put all your effort into trying to find it because you don't want it to go to waste um you may never find it um uh, but really try your absolute best to find it nine times out of ten you will find it um but there's always going to be that one instance where a deer just it, it just gets away and you just can't find it um and it stinks but that's hunting um and you know that's you just got to make sure that you're doing your part and trying to retrieve that deer um, so that it doesn't go to waste. Um, there's actually a, a service out of Oak Hill Kennel and Deer Tracking. Um, they're they're north of Durham. They're kind of near the Virginia line, um, but they do deer tracking for free. Uh, I've never used them. I've just stumbled across them on Facebook, um, but they'll do free deer tracking with their Bavarian Mountain Hounds and their uh, Porcelain Hounds um, and Black and tan coon hounds, those are three that they used. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind as well. If you're hunt, hunting up in that area or if you know a friend, you know, bring in a, a, a deer dog and try and find them because uh, that, like, they work. That's that's for sure. A deer's or a dog's nose is almost as good as a deer. So you're you're likely to find them, especially when that, that's what they're trained to do. Uh, once you get up to the deer, you want to approach cautious, cautiously. Um, looking for you know breathing you want to see if that chest is rising and falling you want to look at the eyes usually they're going to be glazed over you know if it's been a while they're going to be dry um and open obviously um so keep an eye on the eyes keep an eye on the chest cat the chest whether it's you know moving or not um and keep a safe distance away you know all those things might indicate that it's dead but for whatever reason you get up to it and it gets some life to it so just be very very careful you know poke it with a stick if you're kind of in doubt if it's your first kill you know be careful um if it's alive it's perfectly legal to finish it off you know you want to shoot into the heart lung area that's the best way to shoot it that's ethical good to go you don't want to shoot it behind the ears or behind or in the head because that's that's one of those areas that is going to destroy the lymph node that's used for cwd sampling so you want to preserve that if you can um, during rifle and muzzle loader season, you know, keep this in mind, depending on what weapon you're using, um, during rifle and muzzle loader season, you're perfectly fine to, to finish the deer off with whatever pistol you want, as long as you can lawfully own that pistol, of course. Um, you can have that pistol on you, you can finish it off, boom, good to go. Um, but a little, little nuance to the law there, uh, during archery season, it has to be a 22 caliber rimfire pistol. So just keep that in mind if you're planning on doing archery hunting. Uh, if you're going out with a pistol, it, it's got to be a 22 rimfire pistol um, to, to be used for dispatching. Um, but 
if you got to finish it off, do it. Um, put the deer out of its misery. You know, it's it's it, it's no sense making it suffer any longer. Um, and then once the deer has been killed, once all of that is set, um, you're gonna have to complete your big game report card. Um, if you are uh, license exempt, you must obtain the license of exempt big game report card from the wildlife service agents. Uh, quite frankly, I'm, I'm not too familiar with that process, but that, if that applies to you, you will need that. Um, you're going to want to, so, so let me preface this. Uh, I believe these, this new tag uh, came out for the 2020 season, uh, 2020, 2021. Prior to that, I don't think that it had the month or days on it. Uh, I know it's a recent change, but either way, um, it's a newer tag, so keep that in mind. You know, you, there's, it's a little bit newer reporting um, process, uh, but you're going to want to punch out the day, then you're going to want to punch out the month before you touch the deer. So once you confirm that that deer is dead, you, before you move it, before you gut it, field dress it, punch those out, you know, um, it's self-explanatory. I got my tags right here. Like I said, I just got them in the mail. Um, punch that out, whether it's a buck or a doe, be careful. You don't want to, you know, punch out the wrong one. Um, then call 1-800-I-GOT-ONE. That's what I always do. Uh, that's, that's simple. I've usually always got service. It's good to go. Or you can report it online, same thing. Uh, but it's got to be by noon after the harvest or before it is skinned and dismembered. So if you're planning on processing your own deer, you're probably going to take it home and start skinning it right away. Um, that's that's common unless you plan on keeping it cool for a couple of days. That happens as well. Um, but either way, it's got to be done by noon, the day after the harvest, or before it is skinned, whichever comes first. That's that's non-negotiable. That's what's got to happen. Um, so like in my case, the simplest way that I do it. I, I punch the I punch the uh, the date and the month out, and then right then and there, before I get my hands dirty, before I put my gloves on, before I got blood and everything all over me, so I don't forget. Call the number, boom, game over. They'll they'll send you they'll they'll give you the harvest ID or they'll give you the authorization in conjunction that'll match up with your harvest ID if you ever checked. You'll write the uh, authorization number right there on the tag underneath of your, your harvest ID number. So everything all matches. And there you go. Uh, that's that. Uh, the only exception is if you're in a remote area. Uh, but it's it's uh, 2021. So I, I don't really know how that would work out with, with proving, oh, I was in a remote area. Uh, I couldn't report it in time. That I don't know how well that would hold up. Um, so just do it um, as soon as possible. And like I said, I like to do it before I get all all messy and excited from having a deer harvest and I forget. Um, but as I said, this is uh, this is getting to know white tailed deer uh, and shot placement. I really hope that you guys learn something from here. And uh, like I said, moving forward, I'm going to try and have my own pictures. Uh, because I'm going to be taking a lot of pictures when I'm out in the field um, these next couple seasons so that I can have some good stuff to share with you guys. Um, but if you want deer to be there, you're going to have to be out there as well. Uh, you don't want the deer to know you are there. So quiet, eliminate scent, and move slowly, uh, or not at all, if there's deer looking at you. And uh, have a practice, and have practice and can, can make a clean and ethical shot. So like I said earlier, you don't want to just go out into the field during hunting season and you haven't fired that weapon in months. If you haven't fired that weapon since last deer season, you know, you want to be practicing in the summer. Not only is it fun, um, but it's going to make you a better hunter. It's going to work on your shots so that you can have a better, uh, better experience when you're out in the field. You're not going to be trekking for miles trying to track a deer. Um, but other than that, uh, that's all I've got. Um, does anybody have any questions? Let me check the chat real quick. Uh, I didn't. Oh, they're, they're still loading. It's not showing any questions. All right, here we go. How strong is the correlation between the number of times in Iraq and the age of a male? Uh, so, Bill. Um, as far as I know, 
the number of, of points or tines on a, a buck uh, isn't really a good indication of uh, how old the deer is because you got to think uh, there's some deer that are on hunting preserves that are being fed really well. They're getting high protein diets. They're hardly ever pressured other than a short period during the year. And when, when they are pressured, they there's only a certain number of people that are allowed to hunt that deer or that area. Um, so there's some monster bucks or there's some deer out there with monster racks that may not be very old, if that makes sense. So uh, the, the best way, kind of like I, as I said, is to, to go off of the teeth and the jaw and, and how to judge that. Again, I'm not entirely sure. I, I wouldn't be able to look at a, a, a deer's teeth or jaw and tell you how old they are. Um, but that is the way that, you know, I've seen it done personally when I've taken a deer to a check station. Also from Bill, um, is the use of scented attractants acceptable for hunting deer in North Carolina? So first and foremost, let me preface by saying, you know, check the, the regulation digest, uh, which, is, which is right here. I will stop sharing my screen real quick. Um, this is the regulations digest. This is what they look like. Usually they're free. And if you haven't taken hunter's ed yet, you will get one. Um, in that regulation digest, it will tell you what the uh, regulations are for using uh, tractants. If I'm not mistaken, certain game lands have different regulations for whether or not you can use them as well. So you're gonna have to check on the specific game lands. And then there's also newer regulations. I didn't get to hunt last season. Um, I was away for work, but um, there, there's been a newer regulation as to what can and cannot be used for those scented attractants um, to prevent CWD. So that's something that you definitely want to look into. Uh, they're trying to phase out natural scents um, because uh, that that could lead to the transmission of CWD. So everything, the, the general consensus is that things are moving artificial. I'm not sure if that's official yet or not. Um, I'm going to read up on that before the, the season starts. Like I said, I missed last season. Um, but attract, scented attractants are um, legal if there are certain types and whatnot. So you got to make sure that that's, that's what you're using and they're in compliance. Colleen, uh, you can, yep, yep, absolutely. You can get a new di digest when you get your, uh, your license. Um, so a prerequisite for getting the license, Hunter's Ed, and usually you'll get one there as well. Um, any other questions, uh, you can post them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask away. Dr. Liz, over to you. All right, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And we'll just go over the last two slides here and we'll get finished up. Um, so special thanks to New Hill Education and Mentoring Program and all facilitating partners. Um, for those of you who participated tonight, watch for a post webinar email with a link for all materials related to this this evening's webinar, and um, it'll likely also have a link to the recording from tonight's webinar and a registration link for the July 13th webinar, which will be developing a hunting plan. If you have further questions or would like more information on outdoor opportunities, please contact the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program at the link um, or a Facebook page provided. Also check out ncwf.org to learn more about the Wildlife Federation and to join a, lo a local chapter. So thank you all so much for participating this evening and thank you so much to our guest speaker, Killian, for all the great information. And uh, yeah, so unless anybody else has any other questions, we'll go ahead and call it an evening. All right, sounds good. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, hope you have a great evening. Thank you, Killian. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.